than the gunner training dot com. Hey everybody, this is expert communication trainer Dan O'Connor. We're going to be talking about some persuasion techniques that you can use both at work and at home. We'll of course be doing some danger phrases and power phrases. We're going to be talking about the crybaby for our difficult person section of the week. And of course we have our principle of the week. So with all of that great stuff, let's get started. There are three things we're going to be learning about this week so that you can be more persuasive both at work and at home. The first one is what we call a blacklight question. A blacklight question is a question that you ask somebody when they give you an objection to your idea or your product or your service. Many times when we are being persuasive or when we're trying to get someone to buy into our ideas or products or services, basically sell them on something, People have objections, you know. I say, for example, I believe that we should color code the files in the accounting department. And of course, if that's an idea that you bring to the table at work, for example, somebody is going to have an objection to that idea and say, but it's going to take too much time, but that'll cost a lot of money, but you know what I mean. So when that happens, instead of just reacting to someone's objection, Use a blacklight question when you feel it's appropriate and you will uncover what are called false objections. Remember that most of the time when people object to our ideas or our products or our services, those objections are just false to begin with. Most of the time when people say, but I don't like this, but we have to worry about that or whatever their but is, normally they're just saying it because human beings are programmed to object to new things. And those objections are generally not even real. The people don't really care about whatever their objection is. Therefore, we call these false objections. To uncover a false objection... For example, somebody might black -like impugn question. your professional Perfect. abilities. And it's easy to use, or they are easy to use. Take a moment and remember. Start off with whatever is real lead cannot be threatened. Remember, lead and lines if you truly have... You to professional get the skills from your brain out of your mouth because a that are on a certain level really the beginning of a sentence it doesn't matter what case, somebody else says or the thinks sentence. about you For somebody example, just wrote me recently and they were like upset this. because of hmm. what one of their well, coworkers thought about them the and they said what should i do how my basic answer was it is none of your you. business what other people think you can leave off the none of your business if you like what that person thinks of you has absolutely no effect on what your professional abilities really are and i said to the group maybe the reason you're upset is because they're right and what they're doing is calling you out on an area in which you should be improving and someone says in which case that's we don't need to feel threatened or angry. Time. We should feel grateful a that somebody has brought to light like something this. that we should be focusing well, how on. Is the time Under normal circumstances, to however, what we tend to do is our ego gets like involved that. and we start how to become defensive that to you? over things that don't need defending, to you? over things that are irrelevant, and against well, things that are not threats to us anyway. You know, what Susie thinks of me is not a threat to me or my family or my professional abilities or anything. What that customer thinks of me or says to me when you is not a threat to anything to real Realtors, in my life. Example, do this a lot but we tend to be if you're going through a home sometimes you something consumed by distraction and defending tell you, things that don't need well, defending tell me against things the that are not real. So therefore this week what I would like you to do is well, anytime you start really to important. feel defensive <laughs> or as if I'm hey changing and all angry with York. somebody because they've somehow pushed a button or, or touched a nerve People that causes you to arch your back and defend your honor or defend your reputation or whatever it may be. And they'll say something Ask yourself, like, well, I guess it's not that important. Am I right? trying to defend and something that's real? Say, well, great, that because if it's real, by the way, I don't need to be defending it anyway. It can't be threatened. Whatever it is that you were saying. Or, remember, are they simply the bringing to light something that I should focus on because it's an area of weakness and I should listen to that person? So that's not a threat anyway. That's simply an opportunity to grow. You can say, great, that And try and put all ego aside when you start to feel your defensiveness come up. By the way, did you know that Yard, you're gonna have this to week, you know, what your assignment you're is in terms of your principle to after is to not get caught up in defending way, things that don't do need defending now, against things course, that aren't real say, anyway. Well, that's very important. With that principle, you know, the time spent on this I would like you to go forth and remember that this week you're going to be looking at people's hands. 
and you're going to be interpreting somebody, those signs. We're going to be focusing on purging yes, some danger phrases and incorporating some power phrases. First of we're going to be focusing on those three difficult people principles and specifically looking for exploders to deal with and try some of those strategies out with. And we're going to be specifically looking for our ego starting to defend things that don't need defending against things that aren't real anyway. Think of a great and you have addressed their objection. If you can, throw in the actual objection they stated, something such as, well, great, can you give me a couple of days to find out the best solution to fix the wallpaper situation for you? And people will say, oh, yeah, sure. And you'll say, great. By the way, did you notice that big backyard? Or you can say, if somebody says the time spent on this is very important and you do not have a response thought up in advance in case they have that objection, you could say something along the lines of, well, great, I'm glad you told me how important the time spent on this project is to you. Would you mind if I spent a couple of days thinking about the best solution for you and then I'll get back to you on that? And people will say, great, because you have heard their objection and addressed it. And once you've done that, by the way, did you notice how much money we're going to save in the long run? Move along. So that is a black light question. Remember, when somebody objects to whatever it is that you're saying, ask them, how important is that objection to you? And over half the time, people will reveal it as a false objection for you. Easy. The next persuasion technique I'd like to discuss with you today is called the interrogator. <laughs> If you know me, you know I watch way too much reality television, way too much. And one of my favorite reality shows to watch is Judge Judy. And one of the reasons that I watch her is because her verbal patterns are fascinating to me. She is one of the most deliberate tactical communicators I have ever seen in my life. And she's extremely intelligent. Now, if you don't like Judge Judy, that's okay. And I realize that she doesn't communicate with what we might call tact and finesse. However, her precision in her communication is unparalleled, and that can't be denied. For example, when she is asking someone a set of information-gathering questions, you know, a lot of us, when we are in an information-gathering session, we wing it. For example, if we're at work and some supplies went missing from the supply closet, or there was a breakdown in process with one of our orders, or at home, if, for example, uh, your kids come home and they got in trouble at school because they got into a fight in the playground. When we're in that type of information gathering session where we're asking people questions that are going to lead to, I want to know the bottom line, what really happened in this situation. Many times we'll just wing it and we'll start asking people questions. Well, tell me about what happened. We'll start out that way. Or we'll say something such as, tell me your version of the story. Or tell me what you know about this. When if you want somebody to be more likely to give you the answers you're looking for, the truth. And part of that means making them get into the cycle, the rhythm of answering your questions truthfully and comfortably. Here's a process that works wonders to get people to open up to you and to get people in the habit of answering your questions honestly and truthfully. You will watch Judge Judy use this in her show. Instead of simply asking an open-ended question such as, tell me about what happened, ask three closed-ended questions, then an open-ended question. Remember that closed-ended questions are questions that generally require a one-word answer. And an open-ended question requires more than a one-word answer, and if you want to make it easy to ask open-ended questions, just use the lead-in line, tell me about. So for example, here's what you'll see Judge Judy do. If a young boy, for example, is blaming his friend for breaking his bike in the playground, she would never say, hey, Marty, tell me about what happened. She does it like this. She'll say, Marty, you're in the fifth grade, is that correct? And the boy will say, yes, and she'll say, and your bike got broken on the playground on March 3rd. Is that right? Yes. And you claim that Justin here had something to do with that. Is that right? Yes. Tell me about what happened. And the reason she deliberately does that, how she'll say closed-ended question, closed-ended question, closed-ended question, then an open-ended question, is because it gets the person to whom she's speaking 
warmed up by asking them very simple to answer questions. You know, you're in the fifth grade, right? Yes. And your bike got broken one in the playground, is that right? Yes. And you claim Justin had something to do with it, correct? Yes. Tell me about what happened that day. When you do it that way, what happens is the person is accessing the left-hand side of their brain and they're answering the questions and they're thinking, this is easy, I can answer these questions. Yep. And they get into the habit of quick responses. Ask a question, get a response. Ask a question, get a response. Ask a question, get a response. And then you throw in the open-ended question. Tell me about that incident. And what happens is the person's already accessing the left-hand side of his or her brain, which is where memory lives and facts live and figures live, and they're in the habit of answering you, they're in the habit of doing it quickly, and they're in, their habit, they're in the habit of thinking, this is easy, I can answer these questions. When you say things like that, you are much more likely to get the truth, and you're much more likely to get it quicker and more easily, because instead of just winging it, you asked a very deliberate series of questions. Three closed-ended questions, then an open-ended question, that will help you get to the truth much more easily and quickly, and that is the Judge Judy technique for getting to the truth. Now our last persuasion technique is very simple, but do not underestimate the power of it. We talk a lot about open-ended questions and closed-ended questions in these lessons, and today I'd like to introduce you to the tag question, if you have not yet heard of it. This is the tag question. Oh! The tag question is a question that goes like this. It's a nice day outside, isn't it? These are great shoes, aren't they? I love working here, don't you? A tag question is a statement with a quick question at the end, such as, don't you think? Wouldn't you agree? Isn't it? Aren't you? And what happens with the tag question is people are much more likely to answer with a yes. For example, if I were to say to somebody, don't you just love working here? People are less likely to say yes than if I were to have instead said, I just love working here, don't you? Because simply phrasing the question with a ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da don't you? da ba da ba da ba da ba isn't it? da ba da ba da don't you think? Makes people more likely to say yes. I mean, you can say to the average person, honestly, I've done this, try it. You can say to the average person, I just blah, 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 don't you? And watch how people will say yes, what, what? Because you ask a tag question, you are more likely to get a yes for a response. There are many, many ways you can use tag questions. Today, the way I would like you to focus on using them for this week is, I would like you to simply get people into the habit of saying yes to you. Because if you have to make a request of someone, whether it's your boss or a customer or a coworker, your family, your kids, whomever it may be, you know how there are people in our lives that we are used to saying no to? and there are people in our lives that we are used to saying yes to. You want people to be in the habit of saying yes to you. For example, I have two nephews, and when they ask me for something, one of my nephews might start off saying something such as, hey, Uncle Dan, um, I was wondering, could I, and immediately I want to say no. What are you, wait, what are you asking for? What? Okay, no. You know how we do that with some of our kids, and then we have other kids. I have another nephew who will say, hey, Uncle Dan, and I'll say yes. And almost no matter what he's going to ask me, I'm going to say yes because I'm in the habit of saying yes to him. He tends to ask reasonable things and I am in the habit of saying yes to his requests. You want people to be in the habit of saying yes to you because there will come a time when they will be on the fence. You know, this is going to happen on a subconscious level, but they will be on the fence as to whether or not they're going to grant you the request you're making, whether they're going to say yes or no to you. And when you're on the fence about something, what happens is our subconscious will go back in time and try to remember. Well, if I'm really kind of 50-50 about whether to say yes to you now, what's my pattern? What am I used to saying to you? And if we're more likely to say, if we're, if we're more used to saying yes, we're more likely to say yes. If we're used to saying no, we're more likely to say no. That is why you want to get people into the habit of saying yes to you. Again, this is a strategy that many salespeople use. And remember, we are all in sales all the time. We're, we are all selling our ideas and our products and our services. Persuasion and sales are the same thing. And you will notice, for example, if you go in to buy a home with a professional, seasoned salesperson, they'll ask you lots of tag questions. They'll say things like, this is a beautiful backyard, don't you think? Lovely day, isn't it? And they'll keep saying things like that because before they ask you 
to sign an agreement, before they ask you to make an offer, before they ask you to do something or agree to something, they're going to get you into the habit of saying yes to them, which is a strategy we can all implement. Get people into the habit of saying yes to you because you never know when you're going to need it. And you can simply and easily do that using tag questions. So this week, you have three assignments for persuasion. Number one, if somebody objects to an idea or a product or a service that you're offering, ask a black light question that begins with, how important is that to you? Number two, if you are in an information gathering session, use the three-step Judge Judy process for asking questions. Closed-ended, 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 then an open-ended. And number three, get into the habit of asking people tag questions to get them into the habit of saying yes to you. And now it's time for our danger phrases and power phrases for the week. Stop using danger phrases. We're gonna give you the power. What I'm going to do this week is start off with our danger phrases for home. Our first danger phrase for home is very unique. Remember, unique is unique. Something is either unique or it is not. Unique means one of a kind. Therefore, we can't say that something is very unique or kind of unique. It's either unique or it's not. And many times people will mistakenly say things such as, that is very unique, that is the most unique thing, that is super unique. And remember, people generally don't correct us when we misuse words, but that is a very commonly misused word. And you don't want to tarnish your communication reputation by being somebody who misuses that particular phrase. So whether it's at work or at home, remember, something is either unique or it is not. There is no particular power phrase to go along with very unique because that is what we would call a delete phrase. The word that we mean to use is unique. And the other danger phrase that I have for home, which again also applies to work, is honestly. When we say to somebody, would you like my honest opinion? Or when we say to somebody, honestly, I think that yada yada, what that does is it makes it seem like if we're not saying honestly, we're otherwise lying. The more we say, I'm just being honest with you, or would you like my honest opinion, or I'm trying to be honest, or honestly, the more that actually takes away from the power and strength of our message and makes us appear to be less honest than we are. Therefore, what we mean to say is, when instead of saying honestly, the word that we generally mean to be using is frankly. So listen to the difference if I were to say, well, honestly, I don't believe that's the path you should take. And frankly, I do not believe that's the path you should take. One is simply saying I'm going to be open and direct with my communication and the other is, I'm going to tell you the truth. What's the other alternative? <laughs> so remember, honestly, scratch that from your general verbal repertoire, both at work and at home, and along with the word or the phrase, very unique. And those are your danger phrases and power phrases for home this week. And here are your danger phrases for work. First danger phrase is, that's not my job. I'm hoping that if you're investing in this communication training, you have already eliminated that phrase from your verbal repertoire. However, if you have not, and if you are about to say something to somebody at work such as, that's not my job, instead be the savvy, polished professional and say something along the lines of, let me see who can take care of that for you. That's what we mean to say, because at work, no matter what our job is, remember, if we are going to set ourselves apart from the herd and be a polished, competent professional, period, just I am a confident, powerful, polished professional because that's who I am. What that means is when somebody comes to me with a problem at work, and even if it's not my job or it's not within my area of expertise, I'm not going to simply leave them stranded. I'm going to be the person people think of as a problem solver. So if something maybe falls outside of your uh, circle of power, you can let people know that. My powers, while very great, are limited, and unfortunately that is not within my power to do. However, let me find out who can help you with that. 
That's what you want to be telling people. Instead of it's not my job, let me find out whose job that is. Or let me find out who can help you with that. And the last danger phrase for work is, I'll try. We do not want to be seen as somebody who's going to try at work. Instead, if you are trying to convey the message, I am not sure if I can accomplish what you're asking me to do within the time frame you're asking me to do it, you can say that. You could say to somebody, well, I am going to do my best to get this done, but frankly, I cannot guarantee that it will be done within the time frame that you're giving me. You can say something like that. You could say something such as, well, unfortunately, I can't guarantee that this is going to get done to your specifications, but I am going to do everything within my power to do so. You can always say, here's the challenge that I see. However, I'm going to do everything that I can do, but not, I'll try, because you don't want to be seen as somebody who's a trier. You want to be seen as somebody who's a doer. So eliminate the phrase, I'll try, from your professional verbal repertoire and replace it with something more specific, such as, here's what I will do for you. However, frankly, here's the challenge that I see based on what you just told me. So your danger phrases for work are, that's not my job, and I'll try. There are no specific power phrases this week to go with those, but we want to be sending a message instead of, again, that's not my job. We want to be sending a message, I'm a problem solver, and here's how I'm going to solve this problem for you. And instead of saying, I'll try, I'm a trier, we're going to be sending the message, hmm, well, that's not within my particular circle of influence. I'm going to find out who can accomplish what you're asking because I'm a problem solver. And those are your danger phrases and power phrases for the week. And now I'd like to talk about our difficult person for the week. And our difficult person for the week is the crybaby. <laughs> Remember, the crybaby is someone who uses crying as a defense mechanism or as a strategy to get out of having those difficult conversations or as a strategy to get out of taking responsibility for his or her actions. A crybaby is not simply someone who cries. If somebody is crying because they just had some tragic event, that a crybaby does not make them. However, we all know some people who we have to have a little, a little talk with them and we think, oh, I just know the moment I start talking, they're going to start crying. What am I supposed to do about that? Here is what you are supposed to do about that. There are three basic steps in having one of those talks with a crybaby. Step number one, have your tools ready. The tools that you want to use when dealing with a crybaby are a box of tissues and a glass or bottle of water. Here's what I mean. Before you have that talk with the crybaby, you want to have your tools ready. You want to have a box of tissues ready and a glass of water ready because number two, this is the second step now when dealing with a crybaby, when they start to cry, you want to be prepared to offer them both a tissue and a glass of water. So step number one when dealing with a crybaby is to have your tools ready. Those tools consist of tissues and water. Number two is to make the offering. That is step number two when dealing with a crybaby because when you start to talk to them, if they start to cry, instead of doing what the average person does and stopping and you know caressing their shoulder and saying, oh, everything's going to be okay, oh, do you need a moment? What you're going to do is you're going to hand them a tissue along with a glass of water and say, here you are, please take a tissue and a glass of water. And what you're going to do then is go to step number three, which is give them an empowering statement that's going to go something like this. Here you are, please take a tissue and take a drink of water. I can see you're very upset. Would you like to take three or four minutes to compose yourself before we continue with this conversation or are you ready to continue now? Let people know you have three minutes, two minutes, whatever you're willing to give them, don't make it more than five. Two or three minutes to compose yourself or would you like to continue with this conversation now? Because what you want to do is let them know we are continuing with this conversation and I'm not going to cry with you or be your counselor. I'm going to give you these tools. Here's a tissue, wipe your tears, and the glass of water does much more than just hydrate you. If you've ever noticed, for example, when you are watching movies about when people are in the police station, because I know no, none of us have ever been in the police station, and frequently when someone is 
out of control emotionally, the police are used to giving them a glass of water and saying, here, please take a glass of water or take a drink of water. Because what happens is, when you take a drink of water, it forces you to lift your chin up. And human adults find it nearly impossible to be totally out of control emotionally sobbing, for example. When our chins are up, it's almost impossible physiologically. There's something physiological about lifting your head up that makes it very difficult to cry, which is why when you watch, for example, shows like, not that I watch these, but if you were to watch like the Jerry Springer show or the Maury Povich show or the Montel Williams show, when they're finding out who baby's daddy is, uh, what happens is you'll see people cry and do this. <laughs> and when they burst into tears, people naturally put their heads down because that's naturally what we do as human beings. When we're going to cry, we put our heads down like this. When we lift our heads up, it physiologically helps us keep our emotions under control, hence the expression, keep your chin up. And a lot of people will say, look at the light, and that helps you not cry. It's not the looking at the light part, it's the lifting your chin up. So when I'm saying to you, please drink this water and please take this tissue, that's doing more than simply saying, here, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to comfort you in your hour of need. That's not it. And remember what you always want to do is not talk about their crying or, or play into it. You simply want to say something such as, I can see you're upset. Here, please take a tissue and please take a drink of water. Would you like a moment to compose yourself before we continue this conversation or are you ready to, are you ready to continue now? You want to ask people, are you ready right now or do you need two or three minutes to stop the waterworks because this conversation is going forward? And those are the three steps when dealing with a crybaby. Don't take the bait. Don't get hooked into the crybaby. Offer a solution. Here's your solution and offer an empowering statement. Would you like to continue this conversation now? or do you need a few minutes to regain your composure? With those three steps, you will easily get through any situation with a crybaby. And now we have come to our communication principle of the week. Communication principle of the week. And this week I'm going to share one of my favorite principles with you, and that is don't let facts get in the way of the truth. When we talk about not letting facts get in the way of the truth, what that really means is, you know, many times when we are communicating, we focus on facts. You know, for example, I'm at the grocery store and the cashier just said something rude to me or talked on her cell phone while she was helping me and that was rude, poor customer service. That's a fact. However, the truth is, she is doing the best she can with the skill set she has. That's the truth. My mother can say things to me that push my buttons and make me furious and feel like a baby. With just one word, she can do that. She went to that mother school that mothers sometimes go to to learn how to drive their kids nuts with just one word. She went to that school and she can do that. She'll call me up in the middle of the night and say things that drive me insane and want me to say things to her like, stop it! That's a fact. The truth is, I am so grateful to have a mother that calls me up in the middle of the night. I am so grateful to have that sacred relationship in my life. And that's the truth. That I know. You know, the fact is, I'm sitting still here and uh, you're sitting still wherever you are. Maybe you're sitting down and we feel like we're not moving. That's a fact. I'm sitting still. The truth is, we are both hurtling through the universe at like 3,900 miles an hour. That's the truth. The fact is... This seems like a solid object behind me, and this seems like a solid glass. That's a fact, but the truth is, this is all just empty space made up of little molecules moving around so quickly it gives the illusion that this is a solid object, or that that's a television. That's an illusion. The truth is, it's all the same stuff. The truth is, we are all the same stuff. And when it comes to communication, we very frequently let facts get in the way of our truth. Remember that facts are what aggravate us. You just said something disrespectful to me. That is a fact. The truth is, well, what's real about me can't be threatened. And the only reason you're trying to hurt me is because you're hurting. That's the truth. Truth always makes us feel good. It makes us feel at peace. It makes us feel closer to our source. It makes us feel better. 
Facts distract us from that truth. You know, when I watch the news, we find new and unique ways to kill each other every single day on this planet, right? And when you watch the news, it can be sickening how many ways we can think of to torture one another. That's a fact. The truth is, we are all brothers and sisters. It just doesn't really appear that way all the time, right? But I know what the truth is. And facts distract me from the truth all the time. You know, there's reality, and then there's this fantasy that so many of us are living that tends to... And what I want to do is, when I start feeling like I'm being taken away from my source, or from my peace, or from whatever it is that keeps you centered and makes you feel good, whenever someone is doing something to you that makes you upset, angry, offended, whatever it may be, whenever we feel bad, it is based on a fact. And you know how sometimes we are dealing with a difficult person and they're driving us crazy and we're angry about it and we're offended and we sit at home, we bring them home with us, you know, we'll wash dishes with a difficult person. We will eat dinner with our family with that difficult person inside of us. We will sleep with our partner with a difficult person with us because we haven't let them go. And then what happens is we learn one thing about them. For example, we learn one thing that explains their difficult behavior. Like, oh, that's what happened to you that causes, causes you to do that? Well, gee, now I feel terrible because I understand why you behave the way you do, and that's sad. And I'm no longer angry about it because I learned one thing. I learned truth that explained these seemingly chaotic or negative facts around me. That truth always exists. We just might not necessarily know what it is. But I know that when I'm being distracted from my peace, it's based on facts. And what I want to do is try to remember the truth exists, even if I can't see it, and the truth will make me feel good. You know, at nighttime, the sun didn't go away. The sun still exists at night. I just can't see it, but it's still there. And when I can't explain somebody's difficult behavior, it generally tends to come down to hurting people hurt people. If you want me to feel bad, it's because you feel bad. Something's wrong with you. You are sick in some way if you're acting out and trying to hurt others because that is not natural. That is not how human beings are made. We are made to give and receive love. And if you are, for some reason, having difficulty giving and receiving love while getting your needs met at the same time, therefore you're acting out, that's sad. And that's the truth. And that doesn't threaten me. That's the truth. But you just called me a name in front of all of my coworkers. That's a fact that can distract me from all of that truth. So in this sliver in time between moments, events, and responses, you know, between when something happens to us and how we respond to it, try to take a moment sometimes and remember, am I going to respond to this based on the facts, you know, what's happening, or the truth? Whether or not I can see it, touch it, or feel it is irrelevant. There is fact and there is truth. Don't let facts get in the way of your truth. Take a moment to think before we respond about what we are going to respond based on, the facts or the truth. And that is your communication principle for the week. I had a great week this week with all of you. We remember have a, a lot of things that we're gonna be practicing this week. We're gonna be doing, we're gonna be practicing our blacklight questions. We are going to be practicing asking questions like Judge Judy. We're going to be practicing tag questions. We have some danger phrases and power phrases. We're gonna be looking for a crybaby to try out that, st that three-step strategy with. We are going to be uh, using, what was the other one? Oh yeah, our unique skill set phrase. We're going to be focusing on not letting facts get in the way of the truth. And with all of that, I had a great time. I appreciate all of you sticking with me all these weeks. I look forward to seeing you next week. Signing off. These free effective communication skills training course videos brought to you by communication expert keynote speaker Dan O'Connor.